Hi there, I'm Daryl Higa, and I'm a narrative designer here at uh, Wargaming Chicago, Baltimore. Uh, I did a presentation uh, a couple months ago on uh, at the Cantini about uh, grand strategy. We got a lot of uh, good response to that, so I thought what we do here is that we'd uh, record uh, in a little bit more detail, breaking down some of the subjects we talk about. So basically what I wanted to talk about uh, for this one is sort of the evolution of armored doctrine because really at the core of World of Tanks is um, sort of playing armored warfare, you know, uh, using tanks to fight other tanks. But how did we get to this point in history? Because if you know something about the history of the tanks, you know, if you look at like World War I, for instance, it wasn't necessarily inevitable that we would arrive at the place that we are in World of Tanks, where you have these massive tank-on-tank -tank battles. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of go over all of this and discuss it in a little bit more depth. So first of all, I guess um, I'll just deliver this. Because this is a bit more of an academic thing, I will give my backgrounds and credentials as kind of standard for this kind of discussion. For academia, I actually have a, um, a bachelor's uh, from political science, and I specifically covered international relations and political theory. Got that from UCLA. Then I went across town and I got my PhD and actually my master's as well uh, from the School of International Relations at USC. And uh, basically the two areas that I focused on were um, international security studies and international political economy. Um, and then since then, um, uh, you know, like I said, I started in academia, I kind of switched over to games. Uh, working in games, I kind of worked on educational software from 1997, and I've been basically working on console type games uh, PC and PC games from about 2003. Uh, the job that I took in 2003 also entailed a lot of uh, military simulation work. And so I worked on a number of military simulators, including Elect Bilat, uh, JFETS, which is part of the CFFT program, uh, Urban Sim, and C3ITD. And uh, basically, and I started working at Wargaming from about 2013. So that's just a little bit of my background. So I do not profess to be, you know, a military expert or anything like that. But this is an area that I've had a lot of personal interest in. And, you know, I honestly, you do pick up a lot of this stuff just working sort of in the area of sort of strategic studies and everything else. And even for history, uh, even though uh, I almost became a history major, and when I was doing my history work, I was doing a lot of work on like con uh, conventional force balance and things like that. Um, so uh, our, uh, Rybot basically approached me and asked and if I could do a strategy and doctrine series. So uh, what you're seeing now is the first installment of this. Uh, I don't know how many of these we're gonna do. I probably have three or four topics that I'd like to cover. Uh, this one is gonna be specifically on armored doctrine. If you've seen my previous presentation on a sort of grand strategy that was presented at Katini, it's gonna be basically the same thing, but uh, with a lot more detail focused on the actual, actual armored doctrine part. That's a part that I didn't quite get to during the Cantini presentation, so I thought I'd, I'd give it a lot more focus. Um, some of the other topics that I think make sense uh, to talk about is strategy of the great powers and not just grand strategy, but strategy at multiple levels, uh, things like logistics and things like training. Um, you know, hopefully uh, these won't necessarily be really long presentations, but just to give a little bit of a sense of these specific topics. When we talk about strategy and uh, tactics and everything else, um, I like to bring up this sort of a hierarchy. And this hierarchy is not a hierarchy of uh, importance or anything like that. It's sort of the rank order in which things are organized from the scale of the actions of individuals all the way to the actions of nations, right? So at the top of that ladder, I would say, is grand strategy. And that's concerned with making the directions of where the resources and coordination of a nation's effort is going to go. And this is usually because, you know, primarily states are concerned with their security and survival. Um, next is operations, and that's sort of like where forces are employed, how they're, uh, you know, and where they're employed, and you know where the em where um, emphasis is placed. You know, like do I fight in the do I fight in the east? Do I fight in the west? Those kind of questions. Uh, tactics are basically the actual means of employing forces once you're at the battlefield. So this is like, where is my tank facing? 
Where do my infantry go? Where do my machine guns go? You know, these, these kind of more nitty gritty questions, field craft, the specific employment of forces on the battlefield. Uh, then there's, uh, of course, doctrine. And doctrine kind of fits into all of this because doctrine can actually apply to all of these levels. But the idea of doctrine is the thinking that's done usually, uh, typically we think of it as peacetime, but it's also just how people are mentally prepared for uh, warfare. So um, the reason why I mentioned peacetime is if we don't know who our political adversaries may be in, in the next conflict, we'll actually prepare proposals of how we might go, you know, how we might deal with different threats to our security. For instance, in the interwar period, you know, I mentioned this all the time, the United States drafted a number of war plans in case they had to fight against other powers. And ironically, some of the powers that we designed uh, strategies for ended up being our allies in World War II. And some were enemies. And actually, we didn't necessarily anticipate the Axis powers uh, specifically being an alliance between Germany, uh, Japan, and Italy. So, you know, of course, there's some conjecture in all of that. Also, the other reason, too, is that you may have forces that go to uh, battle and have battle experience, but that doesn't apply to everyone. You know, unlike Hollywood and video games, um, in a given conflict or in a given moment in conflict, maybe only a certain percentage of your forces may be experienced may experience a particular battle or a particular incident or uh, learn something on the battlefield. And so what that what doctrine does is allows um, militaries to take that experience and then give it to people who weren't there. And that's sort of the idea behind doctrine. So again, we'll try to cover all of these things. And this is sort of a hierarchy because the first three are sort of the levels of operation. And then the final one is sort of like uh, the theoretical side of it. So for armor doctrine specifically, I break this down and this is, again, we're talking about the evolution of armor doctrine. So I kind of do this in a pretty much a historical order to get us to the point that for the sort of um, kind of uh, warfare between uh, tanks or tank on tank combat that we experience in World of Tanks and the path that we took there. Um, traditionally, uh, I think th this all starts with the idea of cavalry and the role that cavalry played in traditional militaries. Then we talk about maneuver warfare and then sort of how maneuver warfare changed and broke down in World War I to specifically become uh, trench warfare and the rise of defensive doctrine. Uh, from World War I, uh, we, at the, sort of towards the tail end of World War I, because of this trench warfare, we see the emergence of armor. Um, and uh, at the waning days of World War I, one, and also depending on which front you're on, we actually see this idea of infiltration and maneuver warfare and the return to maneuver warfare. Um, in the interwar period, uh, this is more about doctrine, but this is a discussion of how are we going to use this new weapon of war, the tank, and the, the decision was made in terms of, well, we're going to use tanks as infantry support. And that was the predominant mode of thinking, not everyone, but that was kind of the predominant mode of thinking. Excuse me. And then um, after that, we can talk about the decisive battles at uh, Kalkin Gol between the Soviet Union and the um, Imperial Japanese Army. Uh, we can t then talk about Blitzkrieg and, you know, sort of the, the fame of Blitzkrieg and we'll maybe talking a little bit about the details about what Blitzkrieg actually means. And then that kind of brings us finally to tank on tank battle and sort of what we stereotypically think of as World War II tank combat, which may not actually be any of the things that I mentioned before, which um, I think, you know, uh, I think different historians are going to have a different approach to this. So this is my opinion about that. Okay, first of all, let's start with maneuver warfare. And, and by the way, um, 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 all of these pictures here are from the Wargaming family of products, either World of Tanks PC, World of Tanks console. In this case, I... Also needed some other pictures, so I'm borrowing from Total War Arena, which is also part of the Wargaming family. So um, just as an explanation of these um, pictures that you see here, uh, if you're looking at the PowerPoint. Um, anyway, maneuver warfare, um, you know, historically, combat has been determined by the speed at which infantry can move. And 
basically it was an army on army conflict. Um, if you do a lot of strategic studies, this is usually called something called counter force warfare. So, um, and the two the two uh, two contrasting values are counter force warfare and counter value warfare or targeting. And the idea between uh, counter value, which is sort of the, the opposite of it, is that you're going after um, items of value to the target. And let's just talk about nations. That doesn't necessarily only apply to nations, but in the context of this conversation, we're going to be talking about nations. So um, things that, uh, that a, a nation values are its citizens, its city, its industry, you know, the, or uh, critical um, geographic points, right, like mountain passes or harbors or things like that. Um, and then counter value is, of course, the other, the opposing military units. Usually when we talk about warfare, we're talking about one army ta attacking the army of another. We're not just talking about sort of um, going after population centers or things like that. That's pretty much something that we've discovered, uh, that we've introduced with modern warfare, with the introduction of sort of strategic targeting, um, not just nuclear weapons, but even um, bombers and things like that. Not to say that 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 the civilians have not been the target of military conflict prior to the modern era, but in terms of when we think of most, when we talk about strategy and tactics, most of the time we're talking about one uh, one nation's army trying to destroy the military of another nation, right? Um, and because of that, and because the infantry are the primary mode in which combat, you know, for thousands of years, longer really, if you think about it, but let's say that in terms of nation states fighting at least hundreds of years, although traditionally we can go back to sort of the proto-nations, you know, like uh, during classical period of Rome or anything like that, um, or, or further back even, um, we're talking about armies, and armies are composed primarily of infantry, which means that the speed of attack has always been kind of dominated by the rate at which people can walk or run, okay? And um, so because of that, when we talk about maneuver, we're talking about the speed, the, sort of the speed at which militaries can move around large forces. And because we're kind of limited once combat starts by foot, even if you're using longer range weapons, infantry, regardless of whether they're armed with a, a spear or a sword or an arrow or a gun, um, really it's still determined by the speed at which they can move on foot. And so because of that, uh, maneuver warfare uh, is the idea of how can we move our forces into an advantageous position over the other side. And um, typically, though, warfare is attritional, or the idea of wearing down the other side. Two armies clash, and <clears throat> whichever side has maybe superior weapons, superior training, superior morale will come out ahead. However, in the idealized world of military warfare, really the idea of maneuvering and maneuvering into position is considered the ideal. Uh, does not necessarily mean that at all times, with all technologies and in all places, that uh, maneuver warfare is either possible or was historically happened. But when we talk about great generals, when we talk about brilliant strategies, we're typically talking about maneuver warfare and the idea of maneuvering to advantage. And that maneuvering to advantage can even mean that although you may be at a material disadvantage, that you can, that you can pull victory out of that. And so, um, again, this has sort of been the history of warfare uh, up to a certain point. And that's not to say that there haven't been kind of ebb and flow about how maneuverable things are. But again, because most of things have been on foot, that has been sort of the measuring stick by which things happen. Uh, cavalry was an in innovation, though, and this kind of changed things because until the machine gun, cavalry were sort of this the primary unit to achieve uh, rapid mobility, shock, and disruption. And the interesting thing about this, too, is that, again, as I said, because of we think of everything as being kind of limited by the speed at which people can walk or march and run, I guess, in, you know, for short periods of time, um, <clears throat> the horse and horseback military units really had a profound effect because not only now do you have, this, you have speed and you have you know, the weight of a, 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 an infantry on a horseback, which you know, 
gives a tactical advantage, particularly with certain weapons, right? Like lances or swords or spears. Um, and so what cavalry ended up evolving into was sort of the primary military unit that you can exploit weaknesses, penetrate enemy formations by, by rapidly redeploying. Because as you can imagine, if you can only deploy by foot, you're, you're talking about a couple miles per hour at which things can, the speed of uh, that infantry can change. Doesn't matter if you have guns, doesn't matter if you have um, bows and arrows, doesn't matter if you have swords. Uh, that's about the rate of change that you can uh, you can do things. Um, and so cavalry w- was a big historical innovation and it caused, and it basically created a new level of maneuver warfare so that gaining p- critical position on the battlefield was absolutely paramount to victory, right? Uh, what what eventually happened is that as both as uh, both sides of a conflict adopt, adopted cavalry, then one of the other primary roles of cavalry was to counter other cavalry. Right. So if only one, <coughs> excuse me, if only one size has cavalry, you can imagine that being a decisive advantage. But once both sides develop cavalry, then your cavalry is concerned with either c- causing this exploitation or countering the advances of the other side's cavalry. So uh, you can see sort of an evolution here. And you know, if you understand tanks, you kind of get get where I'm going with all of this. And historically, you know, uh, and when I say historically, I'm talking about in the realm of thousands of years, not just decades, is sort of uh, the only major really combat unit that can move faster uh, than, than a human. And uh, there have been other, there have been <clears throat> other beasts of burden, so not necessarily just horses, but the probably the one that we think of most is, is horse-drawn cavalry. So what ended up happening was uh, the invention of the machine gun. And um, we definitely associate this with World War I, but this trend was sort of in play long before that. Uh, as the tail end of the Napoleonic Wars occurred, uh, you know, the, the early and mid-1800s, uh, um, where you had the introduction of firearms, and firearms were becoming increasingly dangerous and increasingly deadly, uh, you still had a problem of uh, density of firepower. A lot of people don't quite understand when you when you watch something like a Napoleonic battle, or uh, you know if you're if you're American like American Civil War, and you watch movies like that, you're it's a little hard for us to understand why they're all standing shoulder to shoulder while loading weapons, but. Uh, while loading their firearms and, and firing their firearms. But you have to understand that the l- length of time it took to uh, prepare these weapons, and because of the fact that most of these weapons were not rifled, the mass-produced ones, at least the muskets, were not rifled, it took a large, it took firepower density to create a desired effect at the point of the target. And, you know, a lot of fighting that happened, even with those kind of firearms, still was hand-to-hand. So. Um, what it meant is that these early firearms, although they created, they had devastating firepower, it still wasn't the kind of concentration of firepower that fundamentally changed how combat occurred. Um, what happened, though, was, in a, was the development of a machine gun. And the machine gun then had a substantial effect on changing how the battlefield and how, uh, how the battlefield looks and how battles were fought. And that's because the um, firepower density just went up a tremendous amount. So if you imagine someone with a musket can fire at a certain rate, or then imagine someone with a rifled um, cartridge gun, that increases their rate of fire even more. Then you start going into the era, uh, you know, like the, the mid to late 1800s, where you start introducing machine guns of increasing reliability. And that, and, uh, you know, things like water cooling, and then providing sort of a consistent, uh, feeding mechanism, the ability to now what used to take tons of men could now be done with a single point. Now this, of course, has a dramatic effect. And what it does is that it reduces the power of maneuver because, you know, just one machine gun emplacement with a handful of infantry can now have the f- same firepower as a large number of, uh, of, p- uh, of uh, infantry. And if you can imagine the difficulty of moving these large groups of infantry around and the relative ease, you know, now, you know, with horseback and 
you know, having a machine gun that's either towed with by a horseback or a small team that's rapidly de deployed by horse, we've suddenly now introduced the firepower, this mass firepower of an entire infantry unit, but reduced it to a size that is now easy to transport. You can see that this created an advantage to the defensive, primarily because machine guns were fairly fixed. Uh, these early machine guns were not something you just pick up and, and walk around with. You did have to place them in place. And they, they did require a crew because you had to service the ammunition as well as uh, aiming it. And then you also had to make sure that the, it cooled, it stayed cool. A lot of these were either, uh, well, I guess there were still air-cooled ones, but, you know, water-cooled and everything else. And what the effect that that had is, and this is prior to World War I, actually, too, like, actually, the tail end of the American Civil War, the introduction, uh, you know, the machine gun wasn't, he, strong, uh, wasn't used a lot, but it already had effect. And then you had m multiple conflicts like Crimea uh, and, and the Boer War and a lot of other conflicts that happened sort of after the American Civil War up to World War I. You could see how warfare had changed and that this density of firepower had moved from a, a doctrine of maneuver and offensive, um, sort of offensive doctrine to a defensive doctrine. And now, once we get to World War I, we see the full effect of that in the, in the idea that you um, basically have these armored pillboxes and those armored pillboxes are very, very difficult to take out. You also have artillery and artillery has also increased in its deadliness, but um, you can still have these hardened locations with a machine gun, and with those machine guns, even though you have troops that now have, uh, you know, weapons that are uh, basically a fully contained cartridge, you're not trying to load your musket like you did in the American Civil War, but even though you have a rifle like that, you still have the problem that a machine gun can create a lot of firepower density in a small area, and that changes uh, warfare from something of maneuver to trench warfare and this idea of a no man's land. Uh, and that basically moved warfare from one of maneuver to one of defense. Now, obviously this is a bad situation and people were dying by the millions. This was not a, tri uh, this was sort of World War, especially when we get to World War I, where the full fruits of industrialization, which had kind of affected the previous wars, were felt in full force in World War I. And World War I was a global conflict. And because of this, the amount of resources that were spent and the sheer scale of the war meant that this whole entrenched defensive, um, defensive doctrine was unacceptable. And so people sought a way to break the stalemate. Uh, one development was, of course, sort of the thing that we're all familiar with from World of Tanks, which is the introduction of armor. And, um, you know, like we had a Centennial event talking about sort of these early tanks and what these early tanks were, I mean, these were extremely high tech at the time. And the idea was that we are going to break the stalemate by again, reintroducing maneuver back into warfare. And how are we gonna do that? If the pillbox and the machine gun are what have caused us to, to stop, or to um, be entrenched in these very static warfare will make the pillbox move. And that's sort of how we came to be, you know, how armor came to be. And the idea is that we will now have mobile pillboxes and the, these will be moving fortresses or moving land ships, you know, uh, uh, that will cross the no man's land and basically allow uh, infantry to advance in and basically uh, uh, resume the offensive. Um, and so that's kind of how the tank came to be. And, you know, and because of that, because of the idea that they were moving pillboxes, you know, they would, they didn't have to go terribly fast. Although honestly, because the technology wasn't there yet, they probably couldn't have moved, moved very fast anyway. And they had to cross very, very difficult terrain. So obviously something um, that was, by the time World War I rolled along, cars uh, were not so common that everyone had them, although we're, you were starting to see that. But certainly cars were plentiful, but cars and, and wheeled transport was not sufficient, which is why you see the emergence of the tank in a, in a form that would be recognizable to us, if not you know completely recognizable in terms of a tank and a turret and everything else, uh, uh, basically a giant rhomboid shape with a giant uh, sort of caterpillar tread on it. 
or two caliperal treads on it that it's able to sort of traverse um, broken terrain, um, what well, you know, what we would consider sort of off-road terrain, and um, also be able to breach small um, holes. Obviously, a large enough uh, hole is still uh, difficult to breach, which is why you see lots of fun, funny attachments to World War One tanks, just because they were trying to figure out ways to, to, to cross over trenches and stuff. And that's why, um, you know, a lot of these early tanks were pr primarily armed with things like machine guns or um, guns that could take out other pillboxes. The idea was that we would use this and advance forward into that no man's land. Um, interestingly enough, the other thing that was starting to be introduced, although that picture is definitely from our event, so you notice it's a modern aircraft in there, but you also had the introduction of aircraft, which would also ch sort of change a lot of the things that I'm talking about, but we're focusing on tanks. Um, so in addition to the innovation of the tank, uh, like I said, there's lots of different people trying to solve this problem because, I mean, people were dying in large numbers uh, during some of these massive campaigns. So infantry tactics also evolved. Um, I think we tend to think of uh, the Western Front, uh, you, typically, I mean, this is sort of uh, one of those things uh, in terms of uh, the way European history is taught, but tend to focus on the Western Front and the trench warfare. What was happening on the East, particularly in conflict between uh, uh, the Imperial Russia and Germany, Imperial Germany, was that their front was far larger and covered a much larger area. So um, there was a lot more use of uh, sort of um, where the lines were not quite as static. And um, what happened was Germany sort of came upon the idea that what if we basically tried to bypass strong points instead of attack them, right? And so, in other words, if you have a pillbox, don't frontally assault the pillbox with infantry, with wave after wave of infantry until you finally capture that pillbox, bypass it, cut off that pillbox from its supply and support, and then deal with it later, right? Because if they're, if they're, in, if they're basically surrounded, there's not much they can do uh, except try to fight their way back out to their own lines, in which case they won't have their pillbox with them, right? So um, th that sort of came into to being. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this is something that is a little bit difficult to understand because of, I think, um, you know, our, our consciousness of military uh, sort of strategy and tactics are so dominated by World War II that we have to realize that this meant pushing the level of control much further down because a, 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 a commander that's controlling an entire front or, con you know, controlling, uh, basically controlling you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of individuals is not going to know, hey, you need to go behind, you know, you need to flank this pillbox and you need to take this ravine here, or you have to look at for this geographic feature there. So what it meant was that, so what Germany had to do is that they developed what we would consider modern squad tactics or what they called infiltration tactics. And the idea was that um, individual military units would work their way around these pillboxes and these other defensive fortifications and bypass them and surround them. And by surrounding them, ultimately you'll destroy them in the long run because either they'll run out of supplies or they'll have to attack uh, and uh, they'll have to attack through your lines to get back to their own lines. And again, like I said, they won't have their pillboxes with them. So th these tactics though, could not just be implemented overnight. Just having that idea was not enough because command had been, uh, command and control had been concentrated at the very, very top for very, very long. And so, you you know, if you think of the Napoleonic era, uh, Napoleon is commanding his generals and his generals are moving around large numbers of forces and that's sort of the unit of maneuver. Now what we're talking about is a unit of maneuver of maybe 20 or 40 people instead of uh, hundreds or thousands. So this is, what this also means is that now um, sort of uh, the tactical control of the battle has been pushed further down and now you need a lot of officers who can think independently and make decisions based on the local terrain. And so basically what we have here is that this sort of became uh, sort of, and, and on the Eastern Front that became necessary simply because the, the fronts were so large. And uh, that sort of became um, the emerging tactic that Germany started developing and was quite effective, and the, both the, 
And when after Germany had developed it, uh, the other, the other, um, the Allies um, also looked at to, to develop these tactics. And sort of that is where the war ended, but that set the stage for World War II because that meant that now we're thinking about not just thinking of command and control at a very high level, but now we're talking about moving command and control further and further down, closer to the, uh, you know, the platoon and the squad level. And this, this is going to change warfare considerably. So that's going on parallel to the development of the tank. Ultimately, though, World War I had a strong impact on the nations who fought it. And that that is that because infantry were still, like, although we had the introduction of the tank, and although the tank did some very interesting things on the battlefield, uh, early, early tanks, um, ultimately infantry still won battles and won the war. So a lot of the thinking was, as we improve the mechanical reliability of these tanks, and as we improve their deadliness, their firepower, their mobility, their primary role would be to support infantry, to be mobile pillboxes. And that basically, that um, because infantry ultimately are the forces that have to win a war, that the tank should be designed to support those infantry. So, um, you know, what, and so what does that mean for the tank? That means the tank has to be able to move with infantry. Again, infantry can only move a couple miles per hour. Um, it uh, basically has to have weapons that can destroy fortifications, things like pillboxes and everything else. And then it also means that, uh, and they should be impervious to things like machine gun fire. So what we see is that in the interwar period, a lot of tanks and armor were developed sort of with this idea of infantry support in mind. Now, this is not to say that this, the battle that comes up next and uh, sort of becomes uh, one of the defining moments in the development of armor warfare is the Battle of Kalk and Gol. And this was between uh, the Soviet Union and the Imperial Japanese Army. And I actually say the Imperial Japanese Army because this is one of those cases where it's a little bit unclear who actually ordered that this conflict start. And that the, there's some, depending on which history you read, some some assert that the army actually went off and started fighting a war on its own without necessarily the, the permission of the central government. But that, that's different history aside, it's also very interesting to read, but a different matter. But um, I'm saying this because this was the first battle. Now, already there are people who are thinking about armored warfare differently than just infantry support. Um, the most controversial one, of course, is sort of like Guderian, um, one of the German generals, um, he, he writes in his post-war memoirs about how he was influenced by uh, sort of the, the works of Little Hart. And uh, Little Hart was a British, was a British uh, military theoretician. And um, the only reason why history gets a little muddied here is that Little Hart was actually um, Guderian's sponsor after the war. So, of course, it, you know, it's really hard to extract exactly who influenced whom. Um, and so the history is a little ambiguous on this point, but suffice to say there were multiple people thinking about it. And if you heard my uh, grand strategy um, presentation, you also know that uh, maybe you'll see that there's a stronger similarity between the Soviets and uh, German thinking. And that's because in the interwar period, when both were considered pariah states, they signed a treaty and basically agreed to do secret military co uh, cooperation because Germany was not allowed to develop tanks. And uh, part of that secret collaboration was uh, Germany building um, and jointly between the Soviets and the Germans running a tank school where they kind of played around with new ideas of armored warfare. They actually developed tanks and played around with tank combat and you know doing test maneuvers and doing exercises and things like that that was uh, for forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. So they. So they did it in Soviet territory so that it would be out of um, monitoring by the uh, Western uh, European powers. So because of that, I think uh, both the Soviets and the Germans actually had much more similar thinking than maybe the rest, the rest of Europe. But Kalkingol specifically is a very interesting point because basically this was a large scale conflict between Imperial Japan and the Soviet Union. And it happened in 1939. So this is really before, just before the outbreak of uh, hostilities 
directly in Europe. Uh, Japan had been fighting for some time since the 30s. I mean, they had, um, you know, first there was the annexation of Korea, which was in, in the late teens. And then they were bit by bit expanding their influence in uh, China, basically um, um, finding any kind of political excuse to absorb more and more of China. And China itself was divided at that time, which made it possible for Japan to do so. Um, so largely the opposition that Japan faced were infantry only, or maybe infantry with a limited number of anti-tank guns. So um, Japan actually had a fair amount of armor and was developing a lot of armor, but they were using armor, as I had talked about before, in the infantry support role and not as a sort of an independent fighting force. In Kulking Gold, they came up against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had organized its armor to be as sort of like an armor force and an armor force that's goal was to punch through the lines and disrupt the enemy. Um, however, um, uh, it was their first experience with using armory, armor in mass as well. And I think both sides, although it was a decisive victory for the Soviet Union, I think both sides learned a lot of important lessons from that. Uh, Japan really never had the industrial capability to change its fate. Uh, it had already kind of, it was not really a land power, and the Imperial Japanese Army was never going to get the kind of resources that the Navy was, had. But I think the Soviets learned a lot from their experience. It validated a lot of things, but they also took a lot of casualties against what should have been an inferior force. So it also caused them to do a lot of evaluation. And I, I should say that a lot of people always wonder about sort of the early Soviet military missteps. And it's not to say that there weren't missteps, but a lot of it, I think, also was related to the fact that internally, you also had a purging of the military by Stalin, and this had a devastating effect on both the Winter winter War and then against the uh, Japanese at Kulkin Gold. But in any case, Kulkin Gold is one of these large armored battles where you start seeing hundreds of tanks on each side in conflict, and it's sort of a prelude to uh, what, what is coming. And, and I think it also pointed out the weakness of the Imperial Japanese armies strategy of using tanks as sort of infantry support. Um, you know, we move forward from Kalkin Goal, and then, we, uh, you know, about a year actually, and, uh, you know, so this is not including Poland and, and, and other things, but I want to focus part, primarily on Battle of France, because um, although Poland was very rapid, I think the Battle of France is what really shocked people about the speed at which the German military was able to sort of um, attack its enemies. And um, basically, uh, the term Blitzkrieg is always used, and I always talk about, oh, Blitzkrieg, the Blitzkrieg tactics and Blitzkrieg strategy and everything else. The funny thing is that Blitzkrieg itself was actually not really used by Germans much, and it wasn't necessarily anything specific. Um, in fact, that was much more of a press term used to describe what was happening. Uh, Germany did have this idea of, uh, I think what's important was that the Germans had decided to organize their armor to fight as uh, basically as armored units. And so they concentrated their armor into armored, uh, armored divisions. And these panzer divisions were basically self-contained armies. And I think that was the big innovation that the German military had. And these panzer divisions were basically primarily driven by, by panzers but they also had their own artillery, their own engineering, their own reconnaissance, and they also had uh, motorized and mechanized, motorized or mechanized infantry. And this is a this is a big deal because basically what it means is that you had infantry that could keep pace with the tanks, and not that not that the tanks would keep pace with the infantry, but that the infantry could keep pace with the tanks. So that's an important distinction. And also, I think it should be pointed out that motorized and mechanized is a big deal. I, in the modern world, of course, you know, everyone's got a car. You know, we think of like, we even have air mobile transport where we're using helicopters and everything else. That's an incredibly expensive thing. And at the, you know, when we're talking about the early days of World War II, um, only select units could be actually motorized or mechanized. And that was a big, big innovation. Because again, when we think of redeploying, you redeployed at the speed that your soldiers can march. So the idea that putting them in trucks and now suddenly they can go hundreds of miles in a day, that's a big, big change, right? And so um, Blitzkrieg is kind of a loose term, but what we're really talking about is 
um, the ability for armored units to act independently of infantry, find a weak spot, attack that weak spot, overwhelm a weak spot, and then more importantly, and actually this is the whole point of armored warfare and what we consider to be sort of blitzkrieg tactics, is not that you've concentrated this armor and that you've attacked a single point. But once you've attacked that point, you break into their rear lines, and then now you are unopposed, right? So the whole thing about armored warfare, it, uh, uh, sort of blitzkrieg and sort of what we think of as the innovation in World War II in, in tank warfare was the idea that you would break through the, those lines and move unopposed to the enemy rear, disrupting their logistics, their HQ, their command and control, all of these things that are in the rear lines where your front, your infantry fight in the front and there's a distance between that and the rear lines for a reason. It's because all those other units are not really there to defend themselves, like artillery is not there to defend themselves. Logistics trains, their primary role is to bring supplies to the front. Uh, communications and HQ, they're supposed to manage the battle, not fight the battle, right? So your ability to break through those lines and disrupt all those things has a massive effect. And what does that cause? It means that your forces now have to withdraw to deal with this you know, attack that basically penetration and exploitation. So now your force has to withdraw, and not only are they withdrawing, they're withdrawing in disarray. So that means the other forces in, in line can then easily exploit the fact that you now have forces that are, that are retreating. Another innovation that Germans sort of introduced, and this, this relates again to this idea of uh, infiltration and, and squ uh, squad-based warfare that we see at the end of World War I, is the idea of Schwerpunkt, sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't know German, I can't pronounce German very well, but Schwerpunkt was the idea that there's a single focusing thought and, and this focus is sort of what drives a military unit. So that, like, so if you have an armored division, they would decide what their Schwerpunkt is and all the subsidiary units are also thinking of how they accomplish their tasks with the idea of reaching this major goal. Okay, and so, and it, it could vary quite a bit, but that's the idea that they all had an organizing principle. And if, if you know modern management principles and everything else, this is, this is kind of how we now run things. But, you know, at the time for a military, that's, that's, what that means is that you're pushing command and control lower and lower, and you're relying on officers that would normally just be taking orders from a general and they are now issuing orders like we're going to we're going for that tree line or we're going to seize that we're going to seize that uh, uh, ditch or you know we're going to dig holes here and hold here those kind of decisions were now being pushed further further down with the expectation that they're trying to meet these bigger goals so that was, these are significant innovations that we tend to kind of collectively call blitzkrieg but really was sort of an amalgamation of different ideas and so then what that comes to, and this is sort of interesting that what we're talking about is sort of the early days, sort of Battle of France, you know, we're talking about like 1940, is what we would consider today sort of the world of world of tanks. And although we talk about Blitzkrieg all the time and everyone talks about Blitzkrieg as armored warfare and everything else, really, as I said earlier, the ideal state in Blitzkrieg is that there are no armored forces in opposition. But what ends up happening, and this is something I talk about all the time when I talk about strategy, and people ask like, so how do you, you know, how do I play map X or how do I play map Y? So my answer is usually I don't have a fixed way because the whole point is even if there's a meta for a map, I, I know I'm using game terms from other games, but even if there's a meta for a map, the truth is because everyone knows that meta, what your role is as a, as a tactician is to break that meta. Right, And so uh, what happens in the case of Blitzkrieg is that everyone suddenly goes, oh my gosh, uh, the Germans have concentrated their armor and they're breaking through. What do we do to counter that? Well, initially, uh, because they had set up their uh, armor as infantry support, armor was dispersed along the entire front line with the idea that, you know, with every infantry, unit, uh, every so often, you know, interspersed with infantry would be tank units so that these tank units could help the, the advance of infantry instead of concentrating them all into single sort of military units. Well, when someone does this to you and is proven very, very effective, you have to develop a counter strategy. And the counter strategy is to concentrate your own tanks and purpose your own tanks 
with countering the armored thrusts of the enemy tanks. Does this begin to sound like cavalry again? That's sort of what I'm talking about here. And so what ends up happening is the evolution of tank warfare and armored warfare ends up being an armored battle it tends to be that now we think of tanks as being the way to counter other tanks, right? So, uh, you know, the, you can have a lopsided advantage for a little while, but if, if a war drags on long enough or if your enemies are smart enough, they'll adapt. And the way they'll adapt is to develop a counter scheme. And the counter scheme to something like Blitzkrieg is basically tank on tank battle. And so, uh, and there are different ways to approach this. The United States took the idea of tanks were meant for breakthrough, which is actually a very literal um, interpretation of sort of the way the German, the way the Germans were implementing it. So, uh, so basically, tank destroyers were concerned with countering armored thrusts. That was sort of the American doctrine, which is why you had. That's why the American tank destroyers almost don't seem like the tank destroyers of other countries. They tend to be turreted and all this other stuff. The, the biggest difference being that they were an open top. But the idea is that these um, uh, tank destroyers would be thrown in harm's way when you had an armored penetration. Uh, uh, most countries decided that their armor units would be used both as a breakthrough weapon against infantry and as an anti-armor uh, unit against armored thrusts. Okay, And so that that's why the tank kind of rose to the primacy of the battlefield, although, you know, World War II is still primarily fought with infantry, uh, tanks become come so to the forefront because they became the pivotal weapon on the ground between uh, sort of like penetration and countering penetration. And that became the big game of if one side starts driving their armor through a location, how do we counter that, counter thrust that? And World of Tanks is the kind of the epitome of that, right? Because we were talking about tank on tank warfare, and that's kind of where all this comes from. And it's kind of interesting to think how we got there from, you know, sort of foot infantry and everything else. And so um, that's sort of what I wanted to talk about and um, how sort of tank on tank warfare evolved. Now, uh, if you have any other comments or questions or uh, any other topic that you'd like to talk about, please uh, let either Rybot know or put comments down below or uh, let us know what you're thinking. Um, I'd like to do more of these. Um, I don't know if it's interesting or not to, to a lot of you. It's interesting to me. I love this stuff. Um, anyway, uh, thanks a lot, and see you out there.